Listeners, readers, I'm so glad you've tuned in. Welcome to the Fox page where we dive deep into the very best books. We end up with a richer understanding of the title at hand, all while learning to read everything a little better. I'm Kimberly Ford, best-selling author, one-time adjunct professor at Berkeley, editor, and PhD in literature. And for anyone out there who doesn't actually traffic in rare books, Foxed Page might be something of a mystery. But foxing are simply those little tiny sort of brownish dots that you sometimes see on the pages of very old, beloved books. As always, the lecture will be divided into three parts. In the first half hour chunk, there won't be any spoilers. We will be diving in to talk about um, why it is that I think you should spend your time reading this book. We will then dive in to the beginning of the novel to talk about the incredible prose, uh, and then we'll finish up. In the second and third sections, we will be talking more in depth about what makes this book so unique. So I'm glad you're here. Can't wait to get started. You can imagine that I'm not a huge reader of your standard bestseller, given that oftentimes plot is more primary in these bestsellers than the quality of prose. One huge exception to this is Madeline Miller's Circe. Circe came out in 2018, it was a huge hit. It followed her Song of Achilles, which is also a book that I love. It was such a hit, in fact, that HBO Max has picked it up and is said to be producing it into an eight part uh, miniseries starring Julia Garner of Ozark fame. So buckle up for that because it promises to be incredible. Uh, those of you who are spending the time, in fact, to be reading the novel and to be communing with me over this excellent piece of literature will, of course, get even more out of that, uh, I'm sure, to be excellent uh, television series coming up. As always, I like to start with the question, why read this book? Uh, what with all the amazing television, not to mention all of the amazing literature out there, you really have to be able to make an argument for why someone should invest the hours that it takes to read a novel. And in this case, I think they are um, very, very well spent hours. Of course, we read for escape, and there is nothing uh, like a, a, a mythological sort of epic book to allow us to escape. We're escaping not even just our daily lives, but in fact, the epoch in which we live. We're traveling all the way to Greece and, and traveling back millennia. I also love a good book that helps us to learn a little something. I am not a mythology fan, was never, um, never a big mythology girl. So for me, there's this real sense of catching up. Uh, I would not have been able really to tell you anything about Cersei. I mostly just confused her with the Cersei on Game of Thrones. Uh, so I really did feel like Madeline Miller was doing me this enormous service. Not only did I learn a lot from the novel, but she then uh, inspired me to go on and read a bunch of other mythology, which is the true test, I think, of whether or not something has been successfully taught. Not only will you be able to escape and will you learn, but Circe is also this incredible page turner. Uh, we have this epic uh, piece of literature and it's drawn, of course, from mythology. And yet she's able to put us into these taught situations where you really are uh, invested in these characters who have come to life and you're really very invested in what will happen to them. Not only is it going to offer you all of those things, but there is something in these wacky, crazy times of ours about endurance and about um, resilience. And certainly Circe, the story of her, uh, of her trials and travails and all of her successes, uh, is, it's, it's really a study in resilience and it's a study of endurance. But there's also something really primal and really interesting and powerful about the idea of this epic of these characters of mythology in general, of having endured for so long, that really what we are talking about here are stories that are that are um, uh, you know as old as modern the modern civilization as we know it. As always, however, that all compels, all pales, uh, with what insanely insanely great prose Madeline Miller writes. Speaking of Madeline Miller, I like to take a quick second and always uh, just pop in and see uh, what the author's biography might offer us in terms of a deeper understanding of literature. I came up in graduate school uh, in an era when we really were excited about the idea of the author being dead. And we were very excited about this idea of, of a text really needing to stand on its own. 
And while that has, you know, very much informed the way that I read and it was very much my orientation in graduate school, I do think that it's interesting to take a quick look at the biography of whoever is writing this, especially if their personal story inflects the piece of literature that you are reading. In the case of Madeline Miller, she's relatively young. She's in her sort of early to mid 40s. Uh, so it's not it's not quite as interesting as talking about, um, you know, the the personal history of a Virginia Woolf who lived through both uh, world wars or or a um, or someone whose whose life has very much informed uh, whose life events have very much informed what they're writing. She is um, someone who went to Brown University. She was then a classics teacher. She then studied drama at Yale. And for anyone who knows anything, uh, being able to study drama at Yale is just an enormous, enormous accomplishment in and of itself. Not only did she study drama at Yale, but she became the director of um, their Shakespeare program, or at least some element of it. She has a couple of kids at last count. Um, and uh, she is busy writing more now, just recently had a novella come out, and of course her Song of Achilles was very popular even before Circe. After we take a look at the biography of the writer, I like to spend a decent amount of time, it's going to be a big chunk of this first session of our gathering, to really dive in and pay attention to what we're reading. If one of the reasons you're listening is to become a quote unquote better reader, which is a um, which is a, a sort of qualifier that I resist because I don't think that reading is something we need to become better at. And I don't really believe that there are better and worse readers. But if you are here because you want to become a better reader, the most simple, most basic thing that I would recommend is simply to pay attention. And it's kind of astonishing once you start paying attention to realize that in fact you have not been <laughs> paying attention. For example, I often will overlook the um, the title of something, specifically chapter titles. If a book uh, used to be more of a convention than it is now, but lots of times you would have a title uh, at the top of a chapter. And I, for whatever reason, would just skip right over those. So the first thing that we're gonna pay attention to is in fact the title of this novel. So Circe, as the title, sounds very straightforward, sounds like there's not much to remark on there, but there are a few things that are very, very important to take into account. One is that it is Circe, a novel. So there's a subtitle here, and in this case, it doesn't sound like much of a significant, significant subtitle, it simply says Circe, a novel, and yet that is hugely important. What Madeline Miller is doing here, it's, it's not an epic poem. It is not, um, it's not in verse at all, thank God, because I'm not a huge poetry person. But what she's doing here is she is taking mythology and putting it into the sort of um, most widely read, arguably, the most widely read genre of our time, which is in the novel. This means that it is made up. It means it's fictional. She has her little standard boilerplate disclaimer in the beginning, in the frontest pages of the book um, about how these characters uh, do not, um, you know, they're not living and they, um, if they resolve, resemble anyone living or dead, that's pure coincidence. So this is thoroughly fiction. So what she's signaling there a little bit is that she is working within the parameters of a known uh, person, this Circe, this known historical, not historical figure, but this known mythological figure. And yet she's going to be taking novelistic license when she is telling us about this version of Circe. The other thing that's crucially important, more important than the subtitle, is the title itself. So um, this is not the tale of Achilles, it's, which is her other book. It's not the tale of Circe. She's getting a little more bold. So in the tale of Achilles, there's some sort of acknowledgement of, of a, it's one tale among many. Here we're getting a little bolder and she's just saying Circe. This is just, she's just using the name of, the, um, of, of this goddess, of this lesser goddess. And it's a very bold step. It's a bold step, you know, the Odyssey was called the Odyssey, it was not called um, Ulysses. So there is a sense here of, well, 
James Joyce then called his version of it Ulysses. But there is that sense of, of, of this is really being um, very much centering this one character. And again, this sounds like something that's not that important, but it's not about Helios. It's not about their entire family. It's not about the, the nymphs and the naiads and the dryads altogether. It is very much focusing on this one person, which is in fact revolutionary. Uh, if you are a big student of mythology, you'll know that a lot of the stories of women are sort of told within the framework of men, within the framework of their fathers or their brothers uh, or their creators. And, and in this case, I'm thinking of Athena being created from the forehead of Zeus. In this case, we are talking about Circe herself. So when you're reading, um, always take time to, to just do a little check-in with yourself about the title of the book, because often it will reveal more uh, than you think at first blush. Okay, then if we open the book and we pass the little, oh, we don't even have to pass the disclaimer. Right in the very first page in these, um, in the liner paper here is a map. So um, one of my three kids is used to be a big fantasy reader. He's now working, so he's not really getting the chance to read a lot. Um, but he, when I, when I said, oh, look, there's a map, he was like, there's always a map. There's always a map because he reads a lot of fantasy. What's interesting to me is that we have this map of Ayaya, of the island that belongs to Circe, and that's important in and of itself. This is not a map of Greece. It's not a map of ancient Greece. It's not a map of uh, the family mythological, um, you know, sort of family tree thing. What we have here is a map of the island that belongs to Circe herself. We also have um, Scylla down at the bottom and we have um, Charybdis here to the side, and we have some Greek boats, but really what we're focusing on here is the terrain of this woman, which is important. It's also a, a map, you know, you'll see a map at the beginning of the Lord of the Rings or at the beginning of uh, um, uh, Game of Thrones. Fantasy novels, because they are creating entire worlds, will often include a map, a drawn map, just like Madeline Miller does here. What's interesting to me is this book feels very realistic in many regards, but we have this map here to show us that she is in fact mapping a territory that feels deeply, uh, it feels deeply sort of fantastical because mythology has a lot in common with fantasy, of course, but it's this, this combination of having it feel both very fantastical in the sense of fantasy, but also something that is deeply familiar because um, as Western civilization has evolved, these mythological stories have in fact um, really informed our body of literature. I like to even just take a look at the next page, which just says Circe. Then we turn the next page and once again, it says Circe, a novel by Madeline Miller. So there's something um, very satisfying in that to me because this emphasis and this repetition, which lots of you I'm sure just, you know, whipped right through these first few pages. But what's important here is, is this notion that we are really digging in, we are really entering into the story of a singular woman, a singular entity. I also really like the fact, of course, that Madeline Miller is a woman who is writing about um, writing about Circe. And in fact, the novel itself is made up of the voice of Circe, but it's also very deeply, in sort of a meta way, made up of the of the voice of Madeline Miller, who is an incredibly skilled writer. Uh, I, I would say she's even a poet, um, and 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 certainly an epic um, poetess in lots of ways, but this idea of Madeline Miller as being a very, very bright, very, um, talented sorcerer, you know, who's really able to conjure this version of Circe. I love the fact that it is not given short shrift. And in fact, on the third page of this book here, we have, again, this reminder of Circe, the importance of the centrality of that figure and also Madeline Miller. I love to look at the dedication. I'm um, I like to think of myself as a, a little bit of a literary groupie and also a little a little bit of a literary sleuth. So Nathaniel in this case it's Nathaniel Drake who is her husband. The Greek that is written under it um, that took some extra sleuthing because I am not a scholar of Greek. It, it's it's the Greek alphabet for the word nostos. 
Nostos being um, the, the sort of loose translation is something that is known or notable or a friend or an acquaintance. So I love that because it's this kind of multivalent term that is right underneath Nathaniel. So you have this sense of it being an, a positive, which basically means it's it's a descriptor. It's a it's another um, way to describe Daniel. I mean, sorry, Nathaniel. <laughs> Whoops. Um, it's clearly I don't know him. I don't know Nathaniel from Daniel, but we're going to presume that Madeline Miller knows them better. So the book is dedicated for Nathaniel Drake, her husband, and there is this Greek word. I also love the privacy and the fact that she has this Greek word in this sort of Greek alphabet, all Greek to me and likely to you, but I love the idea that she saves this sort of private thing. She has this private thing that, that, that is shared between the two of them. It also, because we have this Greek here, is this incredible reminder of the fact that this is a story that has come through many, many iterations and many, many translations. And there is a gap and there should be a gap between the reality of Circe, such as she is, given that she's a mythological creature, uh, mythological figure, but there is this sense of, of, of an unknowable gap between all of us, between any of us. And yet Madeline Miller is bridging not only the Greek language, but she's bridging, you know, ancient Greek language. And then she's also bridging, using that language to bridge our understanding of who Circe is. Uh, okay, then the next page literally says again, Circe. So finally, we are getting to chapter one. We're on page three, and we are now 13 minutes into our time. But I would argue that those are 13 minutes very well spent. We're now gonna go ahead and spend another 13 minutes strictly talking about the very first paragraph. And some of you are thinking, what are we doing belaboring this one paragraph? But I would argue again that that is time very well spent. We have chapter one at the beginning here. We will talk in the next section about the structure of this novel. It's incredibly well structured. There's this incredible sort of woven, um, you know, you might even say she's a bit of a, of a um, Penelope here, weaving this entire story together very, very deftly. But we're not talking about big parts. We're not talking about book one and then sort of um, lots of different intricate um, delineated sections. We're diving right into chapter one. I also love, um, for those of you who have the book in front of you, you can see this. For those of you who don't, there's a there's a, 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 an emblem here that looks very much like a sun. And it's um, in, in my mind, it made me think of Helios, of course, on my second reading, because her uh, Circe's father is, in fact, Helios, the um, the god of the sun, the one who drives the chariot, you know, across the sky. So we have this beautiful um, and sort of letterpress stamped uh, vision of the sun here of Helios, which which again, um, it, it's just another way. It's it's another way to sort of bridge and and to to enrich to bridge us to this to this world um, that would have been highly visual and is highly visual even in Madeline Miller's prose, which is obviously not a visual medium, uh, but but it's also reminding us of of this gap of of the way that we can't quite capture all of these things, but that every piece of this has nuance. Okay. We're going to dive into that very first paragraph. When I was born, the name for what I was did not exist. So what we have here, we're already stopping after the first sentence. It's very, very clear, very declarative prose. So it seems very straightforward, but that's it's a little deceptive and we're going to see why. It's, it's not because it's not deceptive, but but there's a, a richness to it um, that I think doesn't come across in the in the very sort of straightforward declarative language. What's important here is when I was born, I love even the typography here that lots of it's all in caps. Um, there is a boldness to the story and there's a boldness to the way it's starting. So one thing to note here, when I was born, we are going, not only are we hearing the story of Circe, but we're hearing it from the first person. This is always a very important thing whenever you're reading any piece of fiction to take a step back and to acknowledge, is this in the first person? Is it being told by I? I did this, I was born, I did that. Or is it told in the third person? Those are the sort of two standard things. It's not she was born, it's not Circe was born. It is in fact when I was born. 
The second person you don't hear as often, that's the second you, when you were born. And you do hear it sometimes. It's a bit hard to sustain. And certainly um, in, a, in a book this size, it might get to be a bit, um, a bit onerous on the reader. Back to Circe. When I was born, so not only do we have this first person, not only are we going to be hearing directly from Circe herself, but we're going way back to her origin story. Uh, which is not to say that you feel like this is going to be this long epic, because I think the fact that it's only this one lesser goddess makes us think that it's going to be a manageable story. We also, though, have this idea of, of her really looking for her origins. And this is very much an origins story. And there's a lot we're going to discuss about cosmology, about this idea of, of what her world looks like. And it's very important to recognize that everything about her world is going to be couched within this idea of her voice, of her birth, of her story. When I was born, the name for what I was did not exist. Okay, so the name, right away we have this notion of what things are named. So, um, you know, we could talk forever about the importance of the speech act and the way that language reifies and, and sort of brings things to life. Um, and, and of course, the importance of what we, the, the language that we use is something we are highly aware of these days and names being highly important and, 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 and you know, needing uh, lots of care and lots of attention. So what she's saying is when I was born, the name, my name, not Circe, but the name for what I was did not exist. It's also significant in my opinion that we have I repeated twice within the very first line. So in each of these first clauses in the first uh, sentence, we have this repetition of I. So this is not a Circe who is going to be, you know, a wilting uh, wallflower type of Circe. This is one who is, is really interested in, um, in coming forward and in claiming her own uh, sense of who she is. They called me nymph, assuming I would be like my mother and aunts and thousand cousins. So this is very important. We're going from I here, this sort of double iteration of I, and this idea of not being able to be named to an us or a me, them kind of situation. So we go right from I to they. So you have this chasm, which is represented here even by the period, which some of you may just be like, oh my God, are we really talking about punctuation? But again, when we're looking at this um, very close reading of the first paragraph, a period says an enormous amount. And here, what it is separating is this, this I, I, and then them. So this idea, they called me nymph. So this idea of they called me, they are trying to name me. So again, you have this I, they thing happening. And then, so we have nymph, which is a, um, nymph is, is, is a very interesting term because it has to do, we get into this a little bit later, it has to do with a creature who is nubile, a creature who is ready for marriage, like nymphomaniac, for example. So there's a sexualized element to nymph. Um, there's sort of a beguiling kind of sense to it. And it definitely has to do with sex and marriage. So right away, she's being pegged as this thing, which is a nymph. But then we have this really cool thing where after nymph, we have a comma, assuming I would be like my mother and aunts and thousand cousins. So this idea of they assuming something, you all know what assuming does. Assuming here, it's a very bad assumption that is being made by they. And we're not exactly sure who they is, but because we are at the moment of her birth, we can assume that this is the wider community into which she is born. They called me nymph, assuming I would be like my mother and aunts and thousand cousins. So right away, not only are we having a they, I thing, but we're also entering a matriarchy. So we have a mother and an aunt and thousands and thousand cousins. So we, we are setting up this idea of this matriarchy right from the start in, you know, in a Greek mythological realm that is in fact very patriarchal. You know, when you think of myths, mostly, you know, you're thinking of Zeus and you're thinking of the Titans and you're, if you're thinking of them at all. Um, but what, sh what we're pointing to here with Circe and this repetition of the word Circe and this I um, and this idea of not existing and the idea of a nymph is in fact, this matriarchy. The fact that we are talking about a thousand cousins is also introducing here on line three of the novel, this idea of, of cosmology. So nobody, I mean, 
maybe some of us do, but most of us do not in fact have thousands of cousins. So right away we're entering a world where the prose is very clear, um, this sense of, you know, I was born is very easy for us to understand. The notion of thousands of cousins is in fact, or thousand cousins, is not in fact as easy to understand. So the language is vo it's very stabilizing, but right away we have this content that is in fact a little destabilizing. We're entering a realm that is not one of, of the normal 21st century. Least of the lesser goddesses, our powers were so modest they could scarcely ensure our eternities. So we have this hierarchy after we've established the matriarchy, the hierarchy comes into play. The nymphs are the least of the lesser goddesses. So this is a, this is a um, you know, there are thousands and thousands of these gods, and yet we are hearing the story of one of them, of Circe. So right away we know that in fact something exciting and special is going to happen with this one uh, of these lesser goddesses. This next sentence, and um, we're almost to the end of the first paragraph, the next sentence I really want to, 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 to emphasize here the incredible poetry in this prose by Madeline Miller. The next sentence said, we spoke to fish and nurtured flowers, coaxed drops from the clouds or salt from the waves. It is so beautiful, in large part because of this kind of internal rhyme that she is setting up. We spoke to fish and nurtured flowers, coaxed drops from clouds or salt from the waves. So this O sound of spoke, you have it um, repeated again with coaxed. And this idea of flowers and drops, you have this, this uh, vocal sound, this open vowel. Um, and clouds, so we have flowers and clouds. You have this, this repeated vocal sound, whether it's the, the low vowel of the O, the long O, um, in spoke and coaxed, or whether it is the shorter O, flowers and clouds. And then at the end of the sentence, it's going to raise a bit. We have these lower vowels, all of these O sounds, and then we have the salt, of the waves. So the A, the short A and the longer A are slightly higher vowel sound. So what Miller is doing here with all of these vowel sounds is creating a kind of music. It's um, just absolutely stunning prose. She also is doing something really interesting in the sentence with, um, with these consonant sounds, with the initial consonants. So we have spoke, which has both the sibilant sound and that hard plosive of the K. I mean, the, um, the stop of the K. And then we have the fish and the flowers. So we have there the fricative of the F together with the sibilant, the fish and the flowers. So you have the combination of these S sounds, the sh and the s sound together with the F sounds. So she's incorporating essentially an entire world of consonants and vowels in this incredibly harmonious way with this internal rhyme and, and this very sort of thoughtful um, rising at the end of the sentence, all of that is to say, some of you are like, oh my God, what is this analysis? But what I'm trying to point out here is that the reason why the prose is so excellent is because of the care that is taken by Madeline Miller, who really is a poet. I mean, this is, this, this is um, she's working in this long, long tradition of this epic poetry. What she's providing here is, is a very palatable, you probably didn't even really think of it very much when you're reading it, but it's this incredibly palatable and accessible poetry that she has that she has sort of squashed into this novel that also has incredible plot tension. For me, that is the recipe for the perfect book. We're going to end uh, with the last two sentences in this paragraph. That word nymph paced out the length and breadth of our futures. In our language, it means not just goddess, but bride. So. It's very important, one of the things that we will come to again and again when we're, when we're communing over literature is this idea of whatever comes at the end of a sentence and certainly at the end of a paragraph or a chapter has extra weight. It's something that's a bit more important than all of the words that have come before it. 
partly because everything in the sentence or the paragraph is leading toward this word, you know, this sort of ending. And also because just the way that that word, the way that the syntax works, that final word is going to sort of uh, remain unsullied in your head, of course, until you reach the next paragraph. But those breaks between sentences and paragraphs, that is a word that's lingering and gaining a bit more importance. In this case, the word is very important, it's bride. And again, with my, um, my sort of urgency about this very first paragraph, this is a story that has everything to do with being a bride or not being a bride and what the expectations are of, of brides and wives. And we're going to see lots of iterations of brides and wives. But we have, um, we're going to go back a little bit here. That word nymph paced out the length and breadth of our futures. So there's this idea that, um, that, that the future is, is ended by, um, by this idea of becoming a bride. It's sort of like, you know, your, your, your life sort of ends if you become married. And in fact, that is something that Cersei, um, uh, oh, no spoilers, she may or may not resist. Uh, but also this, this um, emphasis in the very last sentence of the paragraph in our language. So she is bringing together this notion of community, even though um, earlier we had this like I, they thing happening. In our language, it means not just goddess, but bride. It's beautiful not only because of the language, this is yet another example of this incredibly rich um, poetry, which I will not break down for you in such detail, but this emphasis on bride um, and this emphasis of, of not sort of having a name and not having an entity, not to mention the importance of language, both for naming, but also as a sort of stratum that all of these um, nymphs exist in, uh, it's it's really putting a lot of emphasis on language in a book that is very preoccupied with naming and language and incantations and sorcery. And again, we might um, leave off in this first section, might leave off with the idea that in fact, Madeline Miller, much like Circe, much like this sorcerer, is doing this incredible magic trick. And, and reading is always this incredible magic trick. And, and, and this idea um, is, is crucial. And it's one that I think should linger in your mind if you're going to uh, be finished today uh, with just this first section. But this notion of, of words and of language and of small black marks on a page as being able to conjure an entire world and the world that is perfectly suited to your experience and your brain and, and the things that are important to you um, it really is a magic trick. So I would argue that not only is Madeline Miller telling the story of a witch, of a sorcerer who's able to conjure and transform, but that Madeline Miller herself is exactly that, is a, is a sort of literary sorcerer who is about to um, essentially create this entire world for us in our heads, which is nothing short of magic. <laughs> first session um, of our gathering to really commune with this amazing novel by Madeline Miller, we uh, discussed why we should read the book, uh, a little bit of biographical information about Miller, and also that opening paragraph, which is just an absolute stunner. In the second section, the second half hour, we're going to talk about the quality of the prose. We're going to discuss the voice. Um, the voice being something that every single thing that we look at together, we will look very carefully at the voice. We touched on this before. In this case, it's very important that the voice here is that of a woman, a Madeline Miller, but more importantly, that it is the woman um, Circe. It is, a, it is a, a goddess, maybe one of the least of the lesser goddesses, but a goddess nonetheless, who is finally sort of having her say in a mythological world that is largely dominated by male voices. Then we are going to discuss the structure of this book, which is, um, you know, these original myths came in these epic poems. In this case, it's a novel. It's not a short novel. So in the sense of, of structure, she really is very, very good and very careful to provide this incredible woven structure that allows you as the reader to both feel the scope, this very, very broad, you know, hundreds and hundreds of years are passing. And yet at the same time, you never feel lost and you never feel like you're sort of adrift, uh, to use an ocean going metaphor there. 
Uh, and then in the last half hour section, we will talk about why this prose is so unique, but let's go ahead and dive into uh, the prose quality here. In the very beginning, we spoke about that very first paragraph of prose in the novel and how a lot of it reads like poetry. That is in part because Madeline Miller is, uh, self-admittedly, she is a an obsessive rewriter and she is someone who's very invested in, in poetry and in Shakespeare in particular. So poetry is very sort of, it's doing hard work. When you're writing a poem, every single word in the poem is sort of load bearing. Every single word has incredible amount of weight. So what Madeline Miller here is writing a long novel, and again, great in scope, and yet every single word is chosen uh, with the utmost care. So I was laughing because some of the words in this book, I, I love a book like this where, um, you know, some of these words, in fact, in, in terms of her choice, are very hard words. Back in the day, we would call them SAT words. Uh, and, and I love, I mean, given that my entire life has been devoted to literature, it's actually not that often that I have to go back um, and, and look something up, but I definitely did need to do that here. Uh, and, and the nice thing about Madeline Miller is she uses this very erudite uh, language and, and diction, but it never feels gratuitous and it also never makes you feel dumb because she always sort of gives you a little hint about what she means. For example, at one point she talks about the shocks and skirls of pain. So a skirl, uh, I imagine this is when she's talking about Prometheus, although I'm not really sure here in my in my little notes. But this idea of a skirl of pain, it's a wailing sound. So like a bagpipe kind of a noise. And what's so beautiful about the word skirl in that sense is it's almost like an onomatopoeic kind of a thing. So it sounds very much like what she is trying to describe. And of course, if you put it together with shocks, the shocks and skirls of pain, you know that it's associated with pain. And there's this very nice interplay also there with shocks and skirls. At one point, she talks about the blossoms being shrunken and etiolated. So in that sense, etiolated means very sort of pale or washed out. But, but in my, I first thought it meant sort of weakened, which is kind of what she's getting at. But again, the fact that she says shrunken in there, um, you know, lets you know more or less what she is talking about. But there is this nice sense of the prose as being very sophisticated and elevated, which partially I think that's just kind of a game for me. And my brain loves all of these different reminders of words that I either haven't seen very often or ones that I don't know at all. And again, to find this in something that was so incredibly popular and such a bestseller, uh, I think it's one of the reasons why it feels like such a rich bestseller. At one point, she talks about the thickest breaks in the forest, B-R-A-K-E-S, um, which made me think of cane breaks or like a wind break. Here in California, we have these wind breaks where you'll have a field and you'll have a long line of tall trees that are that are meant to break the wind. Um, I always thought it was B-R-E-A-K. So this idea of of the breaks in the forest as being like a cane break or, or a wind break, uh, it was so cool. My brain was so happy to have this kind of unusual word. And yet because of the context, I knew what she meant and I had a deeper understanding understanding of these other terms. She also, there's this beautiful phrase about days having narrowed to the ambit of my eyes. And so of course the ambit, it's a little bit, um, it, it's it's um, like the aperture of something. And and you have a sense of that, but there is this, this idea of her using language in a different way, which is both, um, it makes the language feel both more sort of familiar and deepens your understanding, but also makes it feel new. Uh, this unusual word choice of Miller, though, is just one aspect of how gorgeous her prose is. So let's take a look at page 153. This is the first paragraph of chapter 12. So again, we have a simple chapter heading with that beautiful letterpress sun, um, which is reminding us of, of the fact that Helios is sort of ever-present, this sort of male patriarchy. So if we look at the at the prose here, though, we get a sense both of how simple and approachable and accessible this best-selling prose is, but also there are echoes here uh, that are very important and very convincing of the epic poetry of which this is a sort of rewriting. We went the long way back to Ayaya, avoiding Scylla. Eleven days it took. The sky bent its arc over us, clear and bright. 
I stared into the blinding waves, the white flaring sun. No one disturbed me. The men averted their eyes when I passed and I saw them cast a rope I had touched into the waves. I could not blame them. They lived on Knossos and knew too much of witchery already. So in comparison, I wanna read one of the early lines from, from the Odyssey. So this is, again, this is in that, that Greek tradition of, of these epic long um, poems. So they're, they're epic poetry, they're written in verse as opposed to this kind of prose. All the other Greeks who had survived the brutal sack on Troy sailed safely home to their own wives, except this man alone. So you have this very um, sort of dire and very like broad scope here, this idea of all of the men um, being brutally sacked, except everyone went home, uh, except this one man. So we have this, this echo of this epic poetry. We went the long way back to Ayaya, avoiding Scylla, 11 days it took. So one thing to note too, before, when we read that very first paragraph in the first chunk of our discussion, we had an I, they situation set up. Here we're firmly in a we. So we do see Circe in the course of the novel become a part of these different communities. So beginning a chapter with this idea of we went is showing us both this community, but once again, as soon as she has established, in this case, the first person plural, the we, right away we have this opposition because these sailors don't in fact trust her. You know, she touches a rope, they throw it in the sea, that sort of thing. So we have this sense uh, right away of that same dynamic, um, this, this sort of we against them. And then not only do we have this sense of the epic poetry, but we also have a sense here of almost a biblical sense, 11 days it took. We also have a sense of, of a sort of arcane syntax there. Usually you would say it took 11 days, but this idea of 11 days it took is, is both sort of an elevated kind of ancient feel, but also a, a sort of a biblical feel. Then we have this beautiful, this beautiful description of nature. The sky bent its arc over us, clear and bright. I stared into the blinding waves, the white flaring sun. She's, it's, it's, um, not, it's, a, it's a very sort of clear description on some level. The words are very simple, but a notion um, of a white flaring sun, you can imagine all of the water and you can imagine the flashing of this white on the sun. So um, these, this description of, of the sky and the arc is this really beautiful way of reflecting not only the length of the voyage and the difficulty of being on the sea for so long, and the vastness of their journey, but also it's a good reflection of, of the vastness of, of this piece of literature, of this novel that she has written. No one disturbed me is an interesting word choice here because it's both, um, it, it, she, she has control, she has authority in the sense that no one is disturbing her, but there also is a sense of her vulnerability here. And again, when we have, when I passed, and I saw them cast a rope. These internal rhymes that Miller has that are, that are actually really throughout the entire novel are just an incredible way to bring a sort of a, a song to, to what this prose that she's presenting is sort of made of, the very fabric of it. I love this echo here. They lived on Knossos and knew too much of witchery already. So this idea of nosos and nu, uh, we have that K-N. If you're looking at it in the book, nosos is K-N-O-S-S-O-S. -S -S. So that nosos and nu, there, she's, again, um, if you remember the dedication, nostos is this a, a Greek word, a modern Greek word, it's spelled differently. That's about knowledge and about familiarity and about a, a, someone we know. So this idea of nosos as being the very place where these men live and, and this kind of um, wisdom that they have and that they know too much about witchery. So again, we also have this beautiful set of these, these nasals, nosos and new. We have that N sound with the vowels and then witchery. So there's this real contrast that make up these beautiful counterpoints that I think are very much a part of why the prose feels so gorgeous. Uh, we're gonna take a look at page 206, have another little dip into some of this beautiful prose. This is another opening paragraph. This is the beginning of chapter 16. Later, years later, I would hear a song made of our meeting. The boy who sang it was unskilled, missing notes more often than he hit. 
Yet the sweet music of the verses shone through his mangling. I was not surprised by the portrait of myself, the proud witch undone before the hero's sword, kneeling and begging for mercy. Humbling women seem to me a chief pastime of poets, as if there can be no story unless we crawl and weep. So again, we have this sense of, of her power, uh, of, of, of her being able to have her voice, because most of the time she feels that, that women, that especially the, the least of the lesser goddesses, uh, are a pastime of poets. And again, we have these beautiful plosives, the pastime of poets, they're sort of a pasha kind of a feel there. B but there is this sense of this beautiful song that she is her she's hearing secondhand. And again, later, years later, I would hear a song made of our meeting. There you have those beautiful L sounds later, years later, and then a song made of our meeting. So we have all of this repetition of sounds that's just this sort of beautiful, um, beautiful prose, but even more important on some level than the way it sounds is this real, you, you know, beautiful prose does nothing for you if it's not saying anything. But what's important here is this underscoring of the fact that it, it's a very sort of meta idea. She hears the story of herself sung back to her. And even though it's imperfect, it's, it's, it's this sense of, of recognizing herself in prose, which is a beautiful thing. This, this, this chapter is right about the midway of the novel. Um, obviously, beginnings of novels and, and closings of novels are very important, but the midpoint often will offer you up some sort of a gem. And in this case, it's this very nice sort of pause in this meta concept about how important it is for these readers us, the reader, to understand that we are hearing a story that has been told through millennia, literal millennia, but also that this is a story that has not yet been told by Madeline Miller and it has not yet been told in this iteration. And certainly it will have its imperfections, just as this song that was sung by this boy, but now it's being sung by a woman um, and, and it's being told in the first person uh, in a way that is really giving voice to a heroine we have not heard about before. So to wrap up the idea of the prose quality here, it's really stunning in the sense that um, Miller, who is you know a poet, really, really writes like a poet. And yet there's a declarative sort of simplicity to the prose that makes it very accessible. And a little segue uh, as we move on now to talk about the voice. So there is this real feminist stance. That's what's been sort of underlying this idea of Madeline Miller, uh, you know, speaking from the first person as this Circe character. But there's also this idea of her voice as really being an important element that is foregrounding the novel. So when, um, when her brother Aetes discusses in these beautiful metaphors, we're gonna talk about figurative language in the third uh, half hour when we discuss this book. But when he describes his divinity and what it feels like, it's this sense of water overflowing. And what she describes um, it, it is this conch shell and how it's it's sort of this emptiness of it. And then of course, um, Aetes makes the, the, the point that that's, it's not an emptiness, that there's air and that there's a voice. So there's this very um, important naming at the very beginning that her divinity feels on some level like a voice. We also find out with Hermes that she has the voice of a mortal. So she, um, it, it's one of the ways that she's able to bridge this gap between the gods and the mortals. And of course, that's going to become very important because of her marriage eventually, uh, or, or her relationship uh, at, the, at the very end of the book. It's also very important to notice that this voice, which is a distinctly, it's, it's not a divine voice, it's, it's, it's a combination of a divine and human voice. It's also a woman's voice, very clearly, but it is a voice that activates speech and spells. So she is a sorcerer, she is a witch, she is able to transform you know, men into swine and she's able to transform Scylla uh, with her herbs into this beast. So there is this sense of her voice as being a tool, as being a very important tool, which I think we need to, to, to make sure that we are giving the idea of this woman's voice uh, its due. So let's take a look at page 360. This is at the very end of the novel. We're gonna look quickly about um, when she's using her voice, not just to create these spells, but also essentially as a weapon. So 
On page 360, uh, she says at one point, and if you do not see my exile ended, I will expose you again. I will tell Zeus what I did. So this idea of her having gone and helped Prometheus. I will tell him other things as well. All those tiptoeing treasons I heard you whisper with my uncles. I think Zeus would be glad to know how deep the Titan mutiny goes, don't you? So importantly, she is speaking here with her father. So this, at the very end of the book, we have, uh, we're sort of back to where we started, where we have this Helios is kind of at center stage and we have Circe, one of his many, many daughters, standing up to him. And, and the way she's doing it is not um, with a sword and it's not with a gesture. It is in fact with her voice. She's having this confrontation with her father with her voice. You dare to threaten me? he says. And of course, again, here, even the threat has to do with her voice. She's going to tell Zeus something that has happened. These gods, I thought, they always say the same thing. So again, you have this idea of the voice. So it's, so he says, you dare to threaten me? Then she says, I do. So there's this, this incredible sort of this climactic scene where she is daring to step up against her father and he says, you dare threaten me. And she says, I do, which of course for an American is going to have um, the, the resonance of sort of, well, for, for many English speaking, um, unless you say I will, for many English speaking people will have the connotation of marriage. So instead of saying I do as a marriage vow here, what she's talking about is this incredible defiance that is, that is being leveled verbally against her father. Uh, and then down at the bottom of page 361, you have always been the worst of my children, he said. Be sure you do not dishonor me. She says, I have a better idea. I will do as I please. And when you count your children, leave me out. So it's this beautiful, um, not only do we have Circe's voice throughout the book, and not only does her voice change and she uses it in all sorts of different ways, at, at the end of the book, as things are really um, coming to a head and being tied up, she's using that voice essentially as a weapon, as a way to speak truth to power here. You know, she's really, she's really pushing against the patriarchy, literally against, you know, the sun god, essentially, um, and, and saying, count me out. You know, when you, when you talk about me in the future, do not count me as one of your children. So the important thing there being not only that Madeline Miller has resurrected and given voice to this entity, but that the voice then becomes this incredibly empowering tool that Circe is using um, against her most formidable foes. Okay, uh, and then I want to talk a bit about plot because I want to discuss the, uh, the, the structure of the novel. So one of the things that we will talk about in the end of uh, our session is this idea of cosmology and, and, and this kind of immortality. So cosmology is simply a fancy word for this idea of how you v view uh, sort of the bigger metaphysical questions, uh, sort of how you make up your world. So in a Judeo-Christian setting, you would have an idea of some sort of omnipotent, all-knowing, um, all-powerful God who created the earth in seven days, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> Not to be totally irreverent. And, and, and here, you know, the Greek gods with their, you know, with, with their, uh, they have all these different gods. They have a, a totally different cosmology. Different things happen for different reasons. Uh, different gods are responsible for different things. So one of the things that I think is really interesting is how Madeline Miller structures this what is sort of an epic novel, not a, an epic poem, but an epic novel, uh, in a way that both speaks to the, the breadth and the size of this story, but also to the cosmology. So in the beginning, we're going to run very quickly through the plot. In the beginning, we have her in Helios's court. We have the interlude with Prometheus, where she is very sympathetic to him. She falls in love with Glaucus. He um, falls in love with Scylla, so she uses her witchcraft for the first time to transform Scylla. Then she is exiled to Ai Aiaia, where she spends different um, uh, interludes over hundreds of years being Hermes' lover. Then we have uh, this Daedalus comes in and she has to go assist in with Pasiphae, her sister, and the birth of the Minotaur. Then we have the, the experience with Medea and Jason. We have then Odysseus coming uh, onto the island. We have the, the period of time when she needs to 
uh, guard her son Telegonus. And then we have, at the close of the novel, we have Penelope and um, Telemachus. So uh, Telemachus, Penelope being Odysseus's wife and Telemachus being his son. So we, um, I love the ending of this book so much. And I mean, one thing that you all either know about me or you will learn about me is I have a terrible, terrible memory. But the great thing about having a terrible memory is that I never remember plot. And so these things are always evergreen. I never remember, um, you know, that, that, that Beloved gets pregnant in Beloved and it's always a total shock when I find out that happening. That's a spoiler, sorry. Uh, and I never remember how these things, uh, you know, sort of unwind and, and, and how books end. So it was so um, so fun to read this book again and realize that in fact, Circe uh, on some level has a very sort of happy ending um, with her experience uh, w with a partner who is truly loving her in a way that Glaucus did not certainly in a way that, that Odysseus couldn't because of his love for Penelope. So we have this very intricate plot. Again, um, some of these stories we know very well, some of them we don't. Miller does this amazing job of, of having these stories, you know, maybe you know Jason and the Argonauts and you know the story of the Golden Fleece or you know that Medea kills all of her children and her brother. Um, you know, you have these sort of bits and pieces in your memory and Miller does this amazing job of, of incorporating a lot of mythology, reminding you along the way of the stories you're supposed to know. But this idea of having so many different plot points, it really could lead to a lot of confusion. And again, if there were a lot of confusion, this book would not be the bestseller that it is. So one of the things that she does so well to avoid this kind of confusion is this incredible weaving structure. So let's take a look at pages 39 and 40. So this obviously is early in the book and we have the, these sort of, um, these different touch points that we'll return to. So, whoops, I'm on the wrong page. That was 28. Uh, okay, so here we are on 39, we're, and she's talking to Glaucos. This is Cersei talking to Glaucos. She says, oh, sorry, Glaucos says, it must be wonderful to be a god and never bear a mark. My brother once said it feels like water. He considered, yes, I can imagine that, as if you were brimming like an overfilled cup. What brother is that you have not spoken of him before? He has gone to be a king far away. Aetes, he is called. The name felt strange on my tongue after so long. I would have gone with him, but he said no. He sounds like a fool, Glaucos said. What do you mean? He lifted his eyes to mine. You are a golden goddess, beautiful and kind. If I had such a sister, I would never let her go. So we have this sense of, of Circe as being reflected by Glaucos. We're, you know, she, she has this screechy voice. Um, and, and, but this idea of her, um, we have this kind of reminder of her as a sister and as the sister, in fact, of Aetes. So, and here we have another sort of firming up of Glaucos and Aetes is kind of coming back into the narration. So then on page 175, she is with Aetes. And she said this thing where she, um, this could be kind of clunky in, in the hands of a lesser writer. She says, I met Daedalus and Aetes frowns and said, Daedalus, he has been dead for years. So this is the kind of thing that could potentially be very awkward and kind of heavy handed and yet it's not. So it's one of these, it, first we have Aetes in the beginning and he's being sort of re-evoked by Glaucus, you know, maybe 30 pages into the narrative. And then, you know, 140 pages later, she is with Aetes, but then we're having this kind of, th this sense of Daedalus as being, again, sort of resurrected. On page 267, so well into the novel, uh, Telegonus and Circe are together. And when she is talking about this boat, she says, inside was a small boat near the size of Glaucus. So we have this Glaucus being sort of brought back, Glaucus's boat, sorry. We have this idea of Glaucus, an echo of him from the very beginning. We've just met him on page 40. And yet on 267, we have this kind of like a reminder of him. So these characters, there are lots of them, and they each have um, these incredibly distinct characteristics and different relationships with Circe. But Miller does this incredible job of weaving them together and sort of bringing them up in different contexts to play off of each other. But they're also never too far from the reader's consciousness. On 354, for example, this is very close to the end of the book, she is remembering Icarus and Daedalus. Um, Icarus, of course, being the son of Daedalus who flew too close to the sun. I thought of Icarus 
who had died when he was free. Telegonus would die if he were not. So this idea here of, of, of resurrecting, in this case, Icarus, in order to draw a comparison, and again, Icarus, of course, being one of, not of course, but Icarus being one of the more familiar um, myths, it's, it's like a, it's a touchstone that allows us to feel like we understand Telegonus a little better. So again, the structuring of this novel, not only is the prose incredible, not only is the word choice incredible and the character development, but there's the sense of the structure as being incredibly intricate and yet feeling kind of effortless and the reader never feels lost and never feels like you have to go back um maybe you did feel lost i shouldn't say the reader is never lost but there is this this very careful sort of uh reminding us of who these people are with very good descriptions and a positives and a positive just being um a, you know phrase that will help us remember someone it's often set off by commas uh, and of course, I forgot this too, but there is a glossary in the back in case we want to either understand someone better or if we want to just keep these things um, sort of top of top of mind. Okay, and then in order to close this half hour section, we are going to talk a little bit about the sympathy that we have with Circe. So we've talked about the incredible prose, we've talked about her voice, and we've talked about the structure, how well structured the novel is. But there is a sense, if all of those things coming together, Circe does end up being a very sympathetic character. And if you look up the Wikipedia entrance for Circe, you know, she's she's associated with um, being oversexed. She's associated with being cruel. What she's most known for is for turning, um, at least in my memory, for turning all of Odysseus's men into swine. So there's this sense of her as being, yes, a very powerful woman, but often using her witchcraft and sorcery for negative things. So one of the things that, that Miller is doing in this beautiful prose and with this intricate structure and most importantly, with this voice of Circe, this feminine, um, not feminine, but this, this woman's voice, is allowing Circe essentially to defend herself. So, and she does it very, very well um, in a number of different ways. So this is a hard thing to pull off, especially when you have a very well-known character. It's a different thing to be able to then uh, derive sympathy for someone where, where people already have a preconceived notion. So in a Judeo-Christian setting, you would have an idea of some sort of omnipotent, all-knowing, um, all-powerful God who created the earth in seven days, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> Not to be totally irreverent. So in the last half hour of each of our uh, gatherings, I, I'd like to touch on what's unique about the book. And in this case, the book, it, it, it's, it's this incredibly deft exploration of mythology. And we've already discussed many of the reasons why. But one of the things I think that Miller does very best is this very kind of flattering way of helping the reader to, to, to both feel like they understand mythology and, and, and to sort of jog your memory in a way that's incredibly flattering. So we're gonna take a look at page three. We're gonna go right back to the beginning. This is the second paragraph. My mother was one of them, a naiad, guardian of fountains and streams. She caught my father's eye when he came to visit the halls of her own father, Oceanus. Helios and Oceanus were often at each other's tables in those days. They were cousins and equal in age, though they did not look it. My father glowed bright as a, as a just forged bronze, while Oceanus had been born with roomy eyes and a white beard to his lap. Yet they were both titans and preferred each other's company to those new squeaking gods upon Olympus who had not seen the making of the world. So if you're anything like me and you really remembered nothing from your sixth grade mythology classes, all of that was not, it wasn't exactly new, um, but I think if you thought of Titans, if I had thought of Titans, I would have thought of like some sort of Marvel universe, which I also don't know. Um, but but she does this incredible job of, of telling us essentially what a naiad is and who the Titans were and who Oceanos was versus Helios. So it's it's not dumbed down. She's not having to sort of tell us, you know, kind of on the nose what these people are all about. There's a little bit of that, 
and she's also not saying once there were the Titans and then there were the Olympian gods. It's it's all within the realm. It's all sort of within the context of this very intricate plot that she is spinning out. It's just so, so well done. Um, a bit later, she talks about, for example, my father had already departed for his chariot in the sky. So she gives us little remembrances, like little taglines like that. If we have forgotten that Helios has like heliotrope or um, you know things that that are that have to do with the sun, um, we if we have forgotten that, then she'll give us these little things about the chariot, you know, in the sky. Um, and again, it's not insulting in any way. She's not spoon feeding us. It's this very sort of beautiful, very well-turned prose that in fact is giving us important information. Another example, he used his prophecy voice, the one that spoke of future certainties. So again, like I don't know that I even remembered that what the gods say were in fact prophecies that were, would speak of certainties. But she says this in, in, in a way that is a reminder for some of us and perhaps for others in fact is giving us new information. One of the things that we've talked about a, a few different times in a few different ways is, is this cosmology. So for a non-myth reader, it was really interesting to have this entirely new um, and, and very different cosmology. So it's obviously polytheistic in the sense that it's not a monotheism. It's not one God who created everything. Um, and there is obviously a different sense of creation. So you have the fates and the Furies, but the Fates are, are, are the people who are deciding what is going to happen, sort of a, a determinist thing. And then of course you have the Underworld, uh, which is sort of a, well not of course, I shouldn't say of course to all of these things because lots of this was relatively new to me. Um, but but you have different conceptions of, of, of sort of how, um, how creation came about and, and what determines your fate. In fact, it's the Fates in this case. What was interesting for me, and something that I think Madeline Miller handles very deftly, is this idea of immortality. So the, these gods, in fact, um, at the end of the last session, we talked about Glaucos as, as being envious of not having to have a mark on you and of being able to sort of regenerate and to be and to be immortal, essentially. And one of the things that happens in Circe is she does, in fact, um, really have to make some shifts in terms of becoming more mortal. Of course, she has this mortal voice, um, but, but it seems like a very basic point, this idea of in this cosmology that these gods are in fact, uh, you know, they are immortal. They live for thousands and thousands of years. In fact, that's one of the, the real problems that Circe runs into in her romantic life. Uh, but but there is this sense of um, Madeline Miller very deftly handling both this concept of time as being you know hundreds and hundreds of years, and yet the the novel has a very realistic feel. So again, I think it's one of the things. It, it's it if we go back to the the map of Ayaya at the beginning, which usually you would see a map drawn in a work of fantasy. There is this sort of fantastical um, undergirding that really holds the novel together. And yet it's done in such a realistic way that all of us can relate on some level to the trials and tribulations of, um, of this woman who is trying to make her way in the world. One of the elements of the novel that I think is strongest and is unique to this novel is excellent use of figurative language. So figurative language is simile, metaphor, uh, personification, all of those things you learned in sophomore English back in high school. Essentially, the way to think about figurative language is that it has a connotation, it has a meaning that is not just the, you know, sort of um, most obvious meaning. It's, it's something that goes beyond the fact of what the words are saying. One thing um, to recognize, and, and Miller speaks to this when she is talking about her novel, is Homer, in the Odyssey, there's lots and lots of similes, and they're used very, very effectively. And so on some level, this book is, Circe is, is rife with these incredible similes, and that is in some senses an homage uh, on the part of Miller to uh, Homer in his writing of, of the Odyssey. So a metaphor or a simile is most effective when it helps the reader to see something either that is unfamiliar or familiar, but that it helps to see something in a new way. 
so you have two objects that are usually put in relationship to each other. And, and, and if a, a metaphor or a simile is effective, you will have a much better sense, a more clear or a rich or a deeper sense of one or both of those objects. We have looked at other writers who are lesser writers, at least lesser in the figurative language department. And, and sometimes a metaphor will be too far afield. There'll be two things that are too disparate, or it'll just be kind of awkward and, and clunky. Miller is almost never ever, again, this is the poet in her, is almost never having a false step. So let's look at page 28. This is fairly early in the novel, and it's one of the times when we see one of the most sort of extended metaphors. So it's not just, it's not just a quick metaphor, it's an, it, one that, that is sort of involved. And this is also very sort of a meta thing that at the beginning of the novel is, is pointing out to us the importance of this kind of language this kind of non-literal language. So this is Aetes together with Circe, and he says, his, her brother, Aetes, says to Circe, how does your divinity, divinity feel? What do you mean, I said. Here, he said, let me tell you how mine feels, like a column of water that pours ceaselessly over itself and is clear down to its rocks. Now you. I tried answers, like breezes on a crag, like a gull screaming from its nest. He shook his head, no, you are only saying those things because of what I said. What does it really feel like? Close your eyes and think. So essentially what we're having here is, is sort of a class in why metaphors work or why they don't. A shell, I said. Aha, he shook his finger in the air. A shell like a clam or like a conch? A conch. And what is in that shell? A snail? Nothing, I said, air. Those are not the same, he said. Nothing is empty void, while air is what fills all else. It is breath and life and spirit, the words we speak. So beautiful. This, this, so it is breath and life and spirit, the words we speak. It's such a beautiful, and now I'm getting caught up in the prose here at the end. So that, that use of, instead of just having commas, she has that use of and, it slows everything down at the end of the sentence. It, so, and, and I love this distinction, air is not the same thing as nothing. It's a very heady sort of philosophical concept, and it's really helping us understand how Circe feels. Air is breath and life and spirit, the words we speak. So this sense of, of, of words, again, as being primary, of words as being incredibly important, and not only words, but in fact, spoken words, the words that we speak. So right from the start, this is a very primary relationship between siblings, um, one of the only siblings who is in fact uh, on her side, as far as we can tell. And it has this very important uh, function of, of this intimate conversation between the two of them that is defining them, that is also for the uh, astute reader, pointing out the fact that we should be paying attention to figurative language. After Miller is alerting us to the fact that we should be paying attention, she has all of these beautiful similes. Simile is just being a metaphor using like or as. At one point she says, I felt roiled and muddy, my mind like rivers, and it stirred up from its beds. So there was this, this sense of water here. And then we have Aetes when he's angry, his face is like waves when they lift their storm heads. So there's the sense again of water, but, but it's um, the anger that Aetes is feeling has the anger of the entire ocean, you know, the, and, the, and not only the ocean, but the ocean in a storm. At one point she is describing Telegonus and she says his excitement rose in him like a flood. So again, we have this, this, this watery image. So these are some of the more simple of this figurative language, but it, you could go, we could go on and on and on. Um, but one of the things too that's important, and it's no mistake that I chose three different metaphors there, similes that have to do with water, because obviously um, it, it, it's a very important part of life on Greece. Uh, and she lives in an island. Uh, so, so there is this sense of um, water as not only being an important life force, but also as, as being sort of the thing uh, that lies all around them. And so it, it, it feels very natural for her to use this. It's a very um, accessible thing. And presumably it's an experience that most people 
things like riverbeds and water um, and oceans and um, storms and waves. Those are things that most people have access to. Uh, and, and there is this incredible force with water. So it's a very effective uh, sort of terrain for her to be using. At the end of all of our gatherings, we take a look at the close of the novel. As you're reading a novel that's so well, so well structured and so well plotted and so well um, written, it's there's a lot of pressure on the ending. And so I was very, very happy in a kind of a rom-com way to find out that, that not only is the ending absolutely gorgeous, but it's this incredibly um, beautiful, I think, evocation of her resilience and 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 her sense of uh, optimism and her sense of of letting things be and and of facing mortality in a way that I found incredibly inspirational. So we're going to look first on page three eighty two, and I'm going to read um, a little more than usual at the end here. I could feel the fear in myself gleaming like water. These flowers had made Scylla a monster, though all she had done was sneer. Glaucos had become a monster of sorts too, everything that was kind in him driven out by Godhead. I remembered my old terror from Telegonus's birth. What creature waits within me? My imagination conjured up horrors. I would sprout slimy heads and yellow teeth. I would stalk down to the hollow and savage Telemachus. I would stalk down to the hollow and savage Telemachus to pieces. But perhaps I told myself it would not be like that. Perhaps all I hoped for would come to pass, and Telemachus and I would go to Egypt, indeed, and all of those other places. We would cross and recross the seas, living on my witchcraft and his carpentry. So there's a lot of work going on here. It's such a beautiful passage. So um, one of the beautiful things here is we do have this weaving. We have these different elements and reminders. We have Scylla, we have Glaucos, we have Telegonus. It's sort of a, um, you know, her life is really sort of passing before her eyes on some level. And, and, and there is a decent amount of fear in the end here because of the unknown. Essentially at the end of their lives, hers and Telemachus's, there is this question of, of what is next. So then we have this incredible shift. So she says, I could feel the fear in myself. That's the first, um, that's the third paragraph on 382. But the last paragraph there, but perhaps I told myself it would not be like that. So we have this important grammatical shift here into the conditional. So it would not be like that. So she's, the conditional is something that may or may not happen in the future. So she's all of a sudden gone from I'm feeling this fear to, to, to something that is conditional and will be happening in the future. We would cross and recross seas, living on my witchcraft and his carpentry. So there's this kind of fantasy that, that is beginning to emerge for her. And then I love this a bit further down on 383, that conditional voice drops into the um, indicative voice. So we have in the middle of the page here, we have a daughter and then another. Penelope attends my birthing bed. A little further down, the daughters I dream to life are different from Telegonus and different from each other. So again, we have these, these declarative sentences and what's beautiful is we've moved from the present to this conditional and then we're in the present tense again, but we're in this future present tense and yet it's told in the declarative indicative uh, present. So we know that this is what is happening. What is happening is she's having these two daughters with uh, Telemachus. And then we have this gorgeous close here. She is with Telemachus. I listen to his breath warm upon the night air and somehow I am comforted. He does not mean that it does not hurt. He does not mean that we are not frightened. Only that we are here. This is what it means to swim in the tide, to walk the earth and feel it touch your feet. This is what it means to be alive. So in order to be alive um, here, what, what she's talking about is mortality. So if, if a God is always alive um, and, and, and cannot die, there isn't some, a sense of, of, of them as, as not being alive in the same way that a mortal human would be. So then we have this gorgeous last paragraph. Overhead, the constellations dip and wheel. My divinity shines in me like the last rays of the sun before they go down in the sea. 
it's so beautiful because again we have helios who is of course the sun god and who will always be there and who is omnipotent and 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 will um he is immortal and yet for her the the sun is dipping into the sea the the, the sun and the ocean the the naiads and the 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 the, the stuff of life where she has come from oceanus and these titan gods um that is that is ending for her i thought once that gods are the opposite of death but i see now they are more dead than anything for they are unchanging and can hold nothing in their hands all my life i have been moving forward and now i am here i have a mortal's voice let me have the rest i lift the brimming bowl to my lips and drink Ugh, such a beautiful, beautiful ending. So she is choosing, in fact, at this point to become mortal. She is choosing to become uh, a, someone who, who can live with Telemachus and who can be alive in the same way that a mortal creature is alive. It's just an absolutely beautiful ending to this, to this incredible, um, deep, rich epic that we have come to the close of. And I love a book, of course, that ends with a beginning. So there is this idea that she is choosing to become immortal. And, and we have some glimpses of what's going to happen. We have, um, you know, in the present tense, in this declarative tone, the, this sort of wink wink about her um, going with Telemachus and living on his carpentry and her witchcraft and having the two daughters. But there is this sense at the end and end of the book of, of their lives together just beginning. It's absolutely gorgeous. So I hope that today's um, third portion has given you a sense of why this book is unique and why it really deserves our attention. It's a book that certainly um, will merit reading and rereading again and again. And I'm hoping that this three-part deep dive into Madeline Miller's Circe has been helpful and informative and inspirational and that um, you keep on reading. Readers, thank you so much for tuning in today. The lectures really are the lifeblood of the Fox page, but you should really go to thefoxpage.com. There are five minute recommendations where I will predict in about five minutes whether you should or should not tackle Ulysses, or maybe why you shouldn't be so snobby about the recent uh, Leanne Moriarty beach read. There are also talks, no rereading required, on old favorites like Are You There God, It's Me Margaret, or Frog and Toad, which is quite frankly, a literary masterpiece. There's also this very cool thing where you answer a couple of questions and this cool wheel spins around and spits out a recommendation that I think might be exactly what you need and it might be something that stretches you a little bit. Come and check out thefoxpage.com. Thanks for listening and mostly happy reading.